It's about an opportunity for me to look back at all those people that influenced me, that impacted me, that supported me, that lifted me up um, when it didn't look like there was anybody there to lift me up. And it was those people um, that are going to allow me to be on that stage in Canton. And that, to me, is what that moment is going to be about. A lot of them are right here in St. Louis. Kurt Warner in a recent visit to St. Louis talking about the induction into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Less than two weeks now, we continue the countdown to Canton about the Rams legend and Jim Thomas, who was there for all of it, stopping by the game day studios. Countdown to Canton is on for Kurt Warner. Jim Thomas of the Post-Dispatch was there for every snap, every touchdown, every sack and fumbled. He was there for all of it. And now Kurt Warner going into Canton. I thought it'd be fun to go back to the early days when his name was even bantied about when he came into camp. What do you remember even early on? Were they ever high on him? Everybody claims him now. But do you remember anybody saying, hey, this, this kid might be something? I think we're over 100 people now who claim they've discovered <laughs> Kurt Warner. I remember a couple things about the early Kurt. One, that 98 season in Macomb, he was the most interviewed well, he wasn't even third-string candidate. He was a candidate to be the third-string guy. He was the most uh, interviewed camp quarterback ever. One, because McComb, as you recall, was so close to Iowa. Every It seemed like every media outlet in Iowa came down to do an interview with the former Northern Iowa star and Iowa Barnstormer. So he's interviewed a, a lot. And uh, I also remember now, a, a year later, that he was exposed in the expansion draft right. to Cleveland. He was almost a Cleveland Brown, and what would his career have been had Cleveland decided to take him? I've always said that nobody can say we had an idea he'd be really special, or they wouldn't have exposed him in that expansion draft. would have been after the 98 season, right? He played a little bit at the end of 98 because Steve Bono was the quarterback, and they're like, what's oh, the point? Eleven passes, yeah, yeah in, the, in the final game in, in San Francisco. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess the party line now, nearly 20 years later, is, oh, we knew they weren't going to take him. And the, the other little asterisk behind that, another key player on that 99 Super Bowl team, uh, Tom Newton, who did such a great job against Warren Sapp and against Tampa Bay in that NFC title game, he was also on the expansion list. All right, so when Kurt Warner became the quarterback, it was Dick Vermeil's famous, we will rally around Kurt Warner. He had tears in his eyes. I don't know how many conversations you've had with Dick Vermeil, but do we think he really believe that then? I mean, he had no choice, I guess, when Trent Green got injured. Well, they had options, though. Remember, Jeff George was talked about and Jeff Hostetler. And Mike Martz had had the experience with Jeff Hostetler. Remember, Mike Martz had two stints with the Rams. The second stint started in 99, but he was in Washington. So he, he had Hostetler there. And then uh, Mike White, who was, who was part of that uh, Dick Vermeil uh, mafia, Lynn Stiles, oh, yeah. all those close buddies. Who he's, he's still buddies with to this day. He had Jeff George both in the NFL and in college. So it could have been either of those, those two guys. Everybody that I talk to now, whether it be Mike Martz, whether it be Charlie Army, said the decision to go with Kurt Warner was strictly Dick Vermeil. Now, I remember being up in the press box at the then Trans World Dome on that third preseason game in 1999. I turned, I don't know if it was Bernie Nicholas, Tom Wheatley, who then worked the papers, oh, they'll be lucky to win four games right. after, after Trent Green went down, so it shows you what I know. As far as getting into the Hall of Fame, how much of it do you think was the story? I mean, not only what happened out of nowhere in St. Louis, but then he takes the Arizona Cardinals, a down-and-out franchise historically, to the Super Bowl. Is it strictly the numbers that has him in Canton, or do you think the story is part of it? I think it's both. One, if you go all the way back, the Hy-Vee grocery store, uh, meeting the ex-Marine in Brenda Warner, then I believe Brenda Mione was, was, her, was her maiden name, living in uh, her parents' basement for a while on food stamps, stamps sh uh, stocking the shelves at, at Hy-Vee, and then, then where it came. It's one of the most incredible out-of-nowhere stories, I think, in all of professional sports, not just uh, in the NFL, but the numbers are great, too. One, he takes two woe going franchises. The Rams were the losingest team in the 90s when he was there, and this is 1999, so... The They're running out of time, right? We're running out of decade <laughs> to change that. I think game three of that season, when they 99 season, when they beat Cincinnati, they actually passed the Bengals for not the worst team of the 90s, and then we all know how bad uh, the Arizona Cardinals were when he got there. So to do that, but then his numbers, not just in the regular season, but especially 
the playoff numbers, the Super Bowl numbers, one of the best big game playoff quarterbacks in NFL history. I, I was looking up something about a year ago, some records, uh, Super Bowl records, uh, before last year's Super Bowl, and I remember looking, and that at that time, the top three passing games were Kurt Warner number one, Kurt Warner number two, and Kurt Warner number three in Super Bowl history. Now, Tom Brady passed him up with the overtime game in, 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 in the victory over Atlanta for the top spot, but his numbers in the Super Bowl and the playoffs, just incredible. And Brenda will be inducting him into the Hall of Fame, which is fitting because it was always Kurt and Brenda. I thought you were going to say Brenda was going to get inducted, <laughs> which <laughs> might happen. She too. would be in like the sibling Hall of Fame for sports, though, because she was quotable, she was interesting, she was controversial, which leads us to his exit from the Rams. I've heard people debate this. They say, well, if he had stayed, he was kind of beat up at the time. The hand mm -hmm, had gotten beat mm -hmm. up. He almost needed that time in New York to kind of take a back seat to Eli to get healthy again. If he had stayed, it's fun to play that game. Do you think the Rams would have stayed at a high level for a couple more years? Now, Mark Bolger played at a good level, too. He did. He, you know, he, Mark Bolger made two Pro Bowls, and it was hard when, once. Remember that. Let's go back to the start of the 03 season in, in, in the Meadowlands against the New York Giants. Kurt fumbled six times, loses three. That hand was a problem. He couldn't grip the ball. It was actually an old arena league injury that had gotten gradually more chronic and aggravated in the NFL. And Bulger played very well. Remember the, the 03 season, 12-4 and four and double overtime loss to, to Carolina in the playoffs. Otherwise, they might be playing for a Super Bowl. So, yeah, it, it, it's hard to imagine. But we, we may not have seen the rebirth of Kurt. Remember, I think it was his second season in Arizona. He puts a glove on his throwing hand. Nobody wore gloves on their throwing hand back then, and all of a sudden he had his grip back, and he looked like the old Kurt. So it's just, it's an amazing story. I think most people thought, hey, he's beat up, and you know whatever he had, the magic he had, he's lost it. And we've also heard uh, Enos Stan Kroenke mention that he always knew Kurt was. Spe Do you remember ever at Rams Park? Having Stanley come down to your media please, cubicle Mark, please, and say, I got please. a couple of thoughts on. Does anybody remember Stan saying anything about Kurt before it happened? If I had a nickel for every time Stan Kroenke told me how much he liked Kroenke, I'd, I'd still be looking Kurt, for that yes. first nickel. One, even back then, remember, he's the minority owner back then. He's the 40% owner. He was almost never in the building. I don't remember him ever being up in Macomb for training camp, so. Final thought, Kurt's speech. I know last year Orlando did mention St. Louis. I get the sense that Warner, because of how his life changed so dramatically with him and Brenda and the immense popularity he still has here, I think he'll kind of go St. Louis heavy in that speech. You, you get that sense? Well, he, you know, he's definitely going to be thankful to Arizona, but he's definitely not going to forget St. Louis either. And he gave a little bit of a hint at that at the uh, – uh, the Hall of Fame uh, selection day when at the press conference he, he, he was asked about St. Louis and, and he just kind of opened his heart. I thought it was very touching how he'll always have a special place in his heart for St. Louis and how much it meant for him. And He won't forget. He won't forget St. Louis. He, and he shows it by his action because he's still active in charity stuff here. And you've been doing this a long time. You covered the Rams for every single game. You do, 432. 432. That's called Hazard Pay will be coming to you from Lee Enterprises. Did you ever see him rude to anybody? Did you ever see him not no. be polite? I mean, even never. Even now, when your, your first impression of many people, including myself, and even when he started to become a national phenomenon, was nobody can really be like this. He's too good to be true. But that's who he is, and he's still that way now. He's still that way now. Jim, thanks for the time. Jim Thomas of the Post-Dispatch will be in Canton. Jim will be in Canton. That is coming up in less than two weeks.